time for us to check back in with Jesse Stewart and the thread that runs so true. See what happens next. If you missed the first reading, just look in the description below for a playlist. Just across Lonesome Creek at the other end of the foot log was a small country store. It wasn't more than half as large as our coal house. All the merchandise in the store would not have filled a wagon bed. The store was not more than 10 feet long and 6 feet wide, but Nancy Cochran, a slender, blue-eyed, fair-complexioned girl with charcoal black hair, ran the store. She sold pencils, paper, ink, pens, and pinpoints, crackers, cakes, and candy to the Lonesome Valley School pupils. From my desk, I could look through the window on my left during school hours. She would be sitting on the small store porch playing her guitar and singing, Red Wing, Red River Valley, Listen to the Mockingbird, Down by the Old Mill Stream, Barbara Allen, and The Needle's Eye. When she played and sang The Needle's Eye, I almost had to discontinue my class periods. I always had to stop my pupils from tapping their feet. They did it unconsciously. They didn't tap their feet for any other tune, but when she played The Needle's Eye, their dirty bare feet all over the room marked time to the music. I love to hear music, especially a guitar, as well as any of my pupils, but not when I was trying to teach school. Nancy singing the words of these old songs distracted my thoughts. Every time I looked from my window toward her, she was looking toward my school, playing and singing as if directly to me. I rarely saw a customer except my pupils go inside her store. I didn't want to say anything, but I knew I was going to have to if I taught Lonesome Valley School. Monday through Friday of the first week, she played during school hours. And when I went to Conway's after school, Flossie played the old songs on her steel guitar and sang until we went to bed. That was too much guitar music and too much singing. So on Friday afternoon, after school was out, I dropped into the store to see Nancy Cochran. She was sitting in a comfortable armchair with her guitar across her lap. When I entered, she arose, laid her guitar up on the small candy showcase, and asked me very politely if there was anything I wanted. She spoke with soft words, and she was beautiful to see. Immediately, I was sorry for the hard looks I'd given her from my window. Now I wondered if she had seen me frowning at her and I hope she hadn't. I like to have a bottle of ink, I said. I bought the bottle of ink, some paper, and a pencil. I decided that my trustee could help me here. It was not my duty to tell her she was disturbing my school. I would tell John Conway, and he could ease a suggestion to her that would not disturb her, for I knew she felt very kindly toward me. She, too, was about 18 years of age, about as old as Flossie Conway. John Conway was the man to do it. Then there wouldn't be any talk. The following Monday, I'd stayed at the schoolhouse to do some work on my school records, and Don Conway had gone home with his sister and brothers. This was the first afternoon I had stayed at school after my pupils had gone. The room was very silent, and I was busy working when I heard soft footsteps walking around the building. I looked through the window on my left, and I saw Guy Hawkins' head. His uncombed, tussled hair was ruffled by the Lonesome Valley wind. I wondered why he was coming back. I wondered if he had forgotten something. Then I realized this was the first time he had been able to catch me by myself. And I remembered a few other incidents in Greenwood County's rural schools where a pupil had come back to the school when the teacher was there alone and had beaten him. I could recall three or four such incidents, but I didn't have time to think about them. Not now. Guy came in the door with his cap in his hand. I didn't want him to see me looking up at him, but I did see him coming down the broad middle aisle, taking long steps and swinging his big arms. He looked madder than any man or animal I had ever seen. He walked up to my desk and stood silently before me. Did you forget something, Guy? I asked. No, I never forgot nothing, he reminded me. Then what do you want, I asked. Whip you, he said. Why do you want to whip me, I asked him. I didn't like your sister, he said. You know what I done to her. Yes, I know what you did to her, I said. I'm going to do the same thing to you, he threatened. Why do you want to fight me, I asked him. I dropped my pencil and stood up facing him. 
I don't like you, he said. I don't like teachers. I said, never another person with your name would teach this school, not as long as I'm here. It's too bad you don't like me or my name, I said, my temper rising. I won't be satisfied until I've whipped you, he said. Can you go to another school, I asked him. The Valley School is not too far from where you live. No, no, he shouted. If anybody leaves, you'll leave. I was in Lonesome Valley first, and I ain't a-going to no other school because of you. Then there's nothing left for us to do but fight, I said. I've come to teach this school, and I'm going to teach it. Maybe you will, he snarled. I have you pinned in this schoolhouse. I have you where I want you. You can't get away. You can't run. I aim to whip you right where you stand. It's the same place where I whipped your sister. I looked at his face. It was red as a sliced beet. Fire danced in his pale blue elongated eyes. I knew Guy Hawkins meant every word he said. I knew I had to face him and to fight. There was no other way around. I had to think quickly. How would I fight him? Will you let me take my necktie off, I said, remembering I'd been choked by a fellow pulling my necktie once in a fight. Yep, take off that pretty tie, he said. You might get it dirty by the time I'm through with you. I slowly took off my tie. Roll up the sleeves of your white shirt, too, he said, but they'll be dirty by the time I sweep this floor with you. He shot out his long arm, but I ducked. I felt the wind from his thrust against my ear. I mustn't let him clinch me, I thought. Then he came back with another right, and I ducked his second lick. I came around with my first lick, a right, and planted it on his jaw. Not a good lick, but just enough to jar him and make him madder. When he rushed at me, I sidestepped. He missed. By the time he had turned around, I caught him a haymaker on the chin that reeled him. Then I followed up with another lick as hard as I had ever hit a man, yet I didn't bring him down. He came back for more, but he didn't reach me this time. He was right. I did get my shirt dirty. I dove through the air with a flying tackle. I hit him beneath the knees. I tackled like this in football. I tackled hard, and I never tackled anybody harder than Guy. His feet went from under him, and I scooted past on the pine floor. I tackled him so quickly when he had expected me to come back at him with my fist that he went down so fast he couldn't catch with his hands. His face hit flat against the floor and his nose was flattened. The blood spurted as he started to get up. I let him get to his feet. I wondered if I should, for I knew it was either him or me. One of us had to whip. When he did get to his feet after that terrible fall, I waded into him. I hit fast and I hit hard. He swung wild. His fingernail took a streak of hide from my neck and left a red mark that smarted and the blood oozed through. I pounded his chin. I caught him on the beardy jaw. I reeled him back and followed up. I gave him a left to the short ribs while my right in a split second caught his mouth blood spurted again yet he was not through but i knew i had him had enough i panted he didn't answer i didn't ask him a second time i hit him hard enough to knock two men down i reeled him back against a seat i followed up i caught him with a haymaker under the chin and laid him across the desk then he rolled to the floor he lay there with blood running from his nose and mouth. His eyes were rolled back. I was nearly out of breath. My hands ached. My heart pounded. If this is teaching school, I thought, if this goes with it, then I remembered vaguely. I had asked for it. I'd asked for this school. I would take no other. Guy Hawkins lay there, sprawled on the unswept floor. His blood was mingled with the yellow dirt carried into the schoolroom by 70 bare feet. I went back and got the water bucket. With a clean handkerchief, I washed blood from his mouth and nose. I couldn't wash it from his shirt. I put cool water to his forehead. I worked over a pupil, trying to bring him back to his senses, who only a few hours before I had stood beside and tried to teach how to pronounce words when he read. Don't stumble over them like a horse stumbles over frozen ground, I told him, putting it in a language he would understand. 
I had promoted him. I'd sent Guy and Ova after water when other pupils had wanted to go. On their way to get water, I knew they chewed tobacco and thought they were putting something over on me. I had known I couldn't allow them to use tobacco at school. I'd known the time would eventually come, but I wanted to put it off as long as I could. Now I had whipped him, and I wondered, as I looked at him, stretched on the floor, how I had done it. He was really knocked out for the count. I knew the place where we had fought would always be marked. It was difficult to remove blood stain from pine wood. It would always be there, this reminder, as long as I taught school at Lonesome Valley. When Guy Hawkins came to his senses, he looked up at me. I was applying the wet, cool handkerchief to his head. When he started to get up, I helped him to his feet. Mr. Stewart, I really got it poured on me, he admitted. You're some fighter. This was the first time he had ever called me Mr. Stewart. I had heard, but had pretended not to hear, him call me Old Jess every time my back was turned. He had never before, when he had spoken directly to me, called me anything. I'm not much of a fighter until I have to fight, Guy, I said. You asked for it. There was no way around it. I had to fight you. I know it, he said. I've had in mind to whip you ever since I heard you was going to teach this school. But you win. You win fair, too, he honestly admitted. I didn't think you could hit like that. Guy was still weak. His nose and mouth kept bleeding. He didn't have a handkerchief, and I gave him a clean one. Think you could make it home all right, Guy? I think so, he said. He walked slower from the schoolhouse than he had walked in. I was too upset to do any more work on my record book. I stood by the window and watched him walk across the schoolyard, then across the foot log and down the Lonesome Creek Road until he went around the bend and was out of sight. Something told me to watch for Ova sailors. He might return to attack me. I waited several minutes and Ova didn't come. Guy had come to do the job alone. I felt better now that the fight was over and I got the broom and swept the floor. I had quickly learned that the rural teacher was janitor as well and that his janitor work was one of the important things in his school. I believed after my brief experience that the schoolhouse should be made a place of beauty prettier and cleaner than any of the homes the pupils came from, so they would love the house and the surroundings and would think of it as a place of beauty and would want to keep it that way. The floor was easy to sweep, but it was difficult to clean blood from the floor. I carried a coal bucket of sand and poured it on the blood and then shoveled up the sand and carried it out. I had the blood from the floor, then I scrubbed the place, but the stain was there. I could not get it from the oily, soft pine. I knew this was one day in my teaching career I would never forget. News traveled fast in Lonesome Valley. When I reached Conway's, they had gathered in the living room waiting to see me after the fight. They had waited to see if I would be disfigured. They were surprised to see me in one piece after I had fought Guy Hawkins. Ova started to go back with Guy, Don said, but I wouldn't let him go. I told him I'd fight him all over the road. We waited for Guy to come back. He was in bad shape. Everybody knew Guy was going to fight me, and no one had ever seen him beaten up before. No one had ever seen his nose flattened, his lips busted, and his eyes blacked. And this made news. My getting Don Conway back to school had saved me. Before sundown, the news of our fight had reached the valley. Mort Hackless knew about it, and he was surprised. Mort Hackless had seen Guy Hawkins have many a fight. Guy went to the valley on Saturdays and Sundays, and if anybody wanted to fight him, he was always ready. Often, when one didn't want to fight him, he insisted. He was always the winner. Guy Hawkins was respected by a certain group of people who believed that might made right by people who loved a dog fight, chicken fight, man fight, any sort of fight. If Guy Hawkins didn't have trouble at the valley, he sat around the store and told his fighting stories to young boys looking for a hero and traded his fighting stories with the old men who told fighting stories of their dead ancestors that grew and grew with the years. This was one fighting story Guy Hawkins would be slow to tell. 
Not any of the rules of cleanliness I had suggested for my pupils, not any knowledge I was trying to give them, not anything I could do at Lonesome Valley would give me the reputation this fight gave me. I didn't know until after Guy and I had tangled that the people talked behind my back and had said I would be a good teacher as long as I lasted, but my days were numbered in Lonesome Valley. They thought when Guy Hawkins got through with me, the boy sent to teach Lonesome Valley, that I would be catching the old line special in a hurry back to Landsboro. And since there was not much excitement in Lonesome Valley, I believe to this day that many of them craved the excitement of a good fight. They loved to talk about it, and they loved the suspense. For Guy had told everybody he knew in Lonesome Valley, the valley, Chicken Creek, and unknown what he was going to do. Never was any teacher more respected by everybody in his community than I was now. Men that I had met before on the Lonesome Creek Road, men that had shyly spoken or had not spoken at all, stopped and introduced themselves and thanked me for doing the job. And before we stopped talking, nearly everyone said the same thing, that he needed his children at home to help strip cane and cut cane wood and cut tobacco, but he was going to try to do the work himself so he could send his children to school to me. And these words, coming from tall, lean, beardy-faced figures of the earth, men who, when they liked and respected you, would die for you, men who, when they hated and despised you, would kill you, made me feel good. Narragage Lonesome Valley had made men like these. This was their small world. They had been born here. They had married here. Their children had been born here. The only ones who had seen any of the world were those who had fought in World War I. And when these men became vitally interested in sending their children to school to me instead of having them help with the work at home, I knew that I would give all to have a good school for their children whose schooling would end with Lonesome Valley. I knew that now I was respected as a school teacher and that I was somebody in Lonesome Valley and I would proceed with new ideas and with much hard work for my school. I didn't expect Guy Hawkins to return to Lonesome Valley School. I thought his schooling was ended. But when he left the schoolhouse, he didn't take his books. I wondered if he would come back to get them, and if he came, would he bring his father or one of his married brothers with him? Would he start another fight? The same thoughts must have troubled John Conway more than my report about Nancy Cochran's guitar music and singing. When I went to school on Tuesday morning, John went with me. This was John Conway's first visit to the school, for his farm work had piled up on him since all of his children but Flossie were going to school. When we got there, Big Guy Hawkins, with his black eyes, swollen lips, was in a circle with the other pupils going round and round, singing the needle's eye. Guy greeted me. Good morning, Mr. Stewart. Then John Conway smiled and turned to go. I watched him cross the foot log and go into the little store. I joined in the game, the needle's eye with my pupils. Guy Hawkins and I were captains. I was the hard-boiled egg, and he was the soft-boiled egg. When we took pupils from the line and asked them whether they would rather be a soft-boiled or a hard-boiled egg, the majority chose the soft-boiled egg. Guy Hawkins got three-fourths of the pupils. And when we formed our tug of war to pull against each other, his side toppled my side. They pulled us all over the yard, and everybody laughed, especially Guy Hawkins. It was great fun, and never did Guy Hawkins or a pupil ask me about the fight. If they talked about it, I didn't know. I did notice them observing the blood stain on the floor. If Guy Hawkins ever said anything against me to a fellow pupil again, I never heard of it. He had, for the first time, become a pupil like the rest. He had, for the first time, acted as if he was part of our school. That very day, another thing happened. It was during the noon hour. A big, ruddy, complexioned man of perhaps 50 drove down Lonesome Valley with a mule team hitched to a wagon load of coal. He stopped his team in the shade of a giant sycamore and climbed down from his wagon. He walked over to where I was standing. I'd seen this same man go down on this coal wagon toward the valley every day I had taught at Lonesome. This was the first time he had stopped. Are you Mr. Stewart? My name is Bert Eastman, he introduced himself. Yes, I am, I said, shaking his cold, dusty hand. I'm glad to know you. You wouldn't have any drinking water, would you, he said. I'm a bit thirsty. 
Yes, we have water in the schoolhouse, I said. It might be a little warm. Warm water will wet the throat, he said. Then let's go get it, I suggested. He followed me into the school. I looked into the water bucket. It was half full. He started to lift the dipper to drink. Don't drink from that dipper, I snapped, and he let the dipper fall from his hand. Is it poisoned, he asked, startled. No, not that, I said, but no one drinks from a dipper here. He looked curiously at me. What do you use it for, then, he asked. To dip water from the bucket into drinking cups, I said. Wait a minute, and I'll make you a cup. I tore a sheet of paper from a tablet and made him a paper cup. He dipped the water from the bucket and poured it into the cup. People don't drink one another's slobbers this way, do they? He laughed after he had finished drinking. But I wasn't exactly thirsty. I wanted to see the man that whipped Guy Hawkins. He beamed admiringly as he looked me over. That boy came up to upper lonesome church one night he continued and he nearly beat my boy to death without any reason he wanted a fight he started it with my boy and beat him up whipped les brown's boy and booting tolliver's boy the same night i wanted to see the first man to whip him say he continued as he looked me over from head to foot you're not such a big man i'd have thought you had to be a giant to whip him and when we walked out of the schoolhouse back toward his wagon, he stopped. He stood for a minute and looked at Big Guy Hawkins, who was now enjoying himself playing games, and I was looking at his wagon load of coal. How many bushels do you have on this wagon, I asked. Twenty-five bushels, he said. You weigh your coal, I asked. Nope, he said. Then how do you know how many bushels you have? In the meantime, Don Conway walked over where we were standing. Guess at it, he said. I believe you've got more than 25 bushels on your wagon. You got any way of finding out? Do you know the length, width, and depth of your wagon bed, I asked. Nope, he answered. Don, run in and fetch the yardstick from my desk, I said. Don brought the yardstick and did the measuring, and I put the figures on paper. Don was very much interested as I figured the number of bushels on the wagon. According to my figures, you have 39 and a fraction bushels, I said. Since your coal is stacked a little higher than the bed, I wouldn't be surprised if you have over 40 bushels. What? he exclaimed. I've been selling this wagon bed of coal for 25 bushels for the past seven years. How can I really find out how much coal I have? Have it weighed down at the valley, I said. They have scales there. Bert Eastman, greatly excited, climbed onto his coal wagon and drove down the road. That afternoon, just a few minutes before it was time to dismiss school, there was a knock on the wall beside our open schoolhouse door. I went to the door. There stood Bert, his face beaming. His face was so dirty with coal dust that his not too white teeth looked white as dogwood blossoms in April. His smile was so broad he was showing nearly all his teeth. Thank you a hundred times, young man, were his first words. I don't know how I can ever repay you. I had 43 bushels of coal on my wagon. Here, he exclaimed excitedly, showing me the way bill. I called Don Conway from the schoolroom and let him see it. Something told me to stop here and take a look at you, Bert Eastman said, and I'm glad I stopped. I've been swindled for seven years. Well, you can rest assured you've given good measure, I said. Your conscience won't bother you. You've not cheated anyone. But I won't be cheated from now on, he said. Gee, I wished I'd gone to school. Can't write my name. You can come here if you want to, I invited him. Too late to start at 50, he admitted sadly. Too late when a man is married and has nine children. His words were worth more to Don than my words or any other teacher's words. Don now realized the value of a simple education. I've just been thinking, Mr. Stewart, whether you were married or not, Bert Eastman said. I know you're old enough to teach school or you wouldn't be here. And when you're old enough to teach school, you're old enough to be married. No, I'm not married, I laughed, having any prospects. 
Then I've a prospect for you, he said rejoicingly. See, I want to do something for you. May Woods, the teacher at Upper Lonesome, is pretty as a speckled pup. She's the right gal for you, has long black hair, big brown eyes shaded with heavy eyelashes. If I was a young single man, I'd go for her myself. When Bert Eastman said these words, my pupils laughed until I had to pound on the wall for order. Guy Hawkins and Ova Sailors laughed until they shook all over. They whispered to each other and laughed out loud. For since John Conway had visited Nancy Cochran's store, they weren't entertained with guitar music and singing during the school hours, and they had listened to every word Bar Eastman had said to me, although he had tried to whisper. Before he left, he assured me that he would fix up everything with May Woods for me. <laughs> we'll stop right there. My goodness, he's having a, having a really exciting time there at Lonesome Valley. That first part that we talked about before we get to the major fight, Nancy Cochran, wouldn't you just like to have seen her sitting out there playing her guitar and singing? Oh, I'd like to have heard her too, but uh, just thinking about it, how she entertained herself with those old songs. And uh, she probably was trying to do it maybe to get Jesse's attention there. Or maybe she just wanted to, maybe she's just passing the time of day and she just really liked to sing and play her guitar. Um, but probably she was probably doing it a little bit for him and maybe for the kids too maybe she knew they really liked it i liked that part when he talked about how on that one certain song they would all mark time to the music he called it tap their feet uh, pap my my daddy he'd done that and um uh, well he done it you know because he was a musician and he played music to help him stay in time and all that but sometimes he would get really loud so i think about like in church you could hear him all over the house all over the church house with his foot pap and you knew it was him doing it so um i liked though thinking about all those little kids all those bare feet you know probably maybe they were working on their um, arithmetic their math or something and then all the while they were keeping time though by patting their little bare feet i like to really like to think about that and then the fight, what a fight. Can you just imagine having to fight one of your students like that? And then note, we know from the first reading that Guy was actually older than Jesse. He was actually older than him and a bigger person too. But it uh, makes you wonder why in the world Guy wanted to fight him like that. And you know, the horror that he had fought his sister too and sent her home. And that was why Jesse wanted to uh, end up teaching there. But my goodness, what a fight. Can you just, I mean, I don't like to see fights, so I wouldn't want to see it, but I mean, just the way it sounded, it was really rather violent on both sides for both of them. And I guess Jesse just had to really get his nerve up and really he was determined, you're not going to stop me. And that's how he, because he, he even surprised himself that he actually whipped guy that even surprised him. Interesting that everybody knew about it though, and no one told him. You'd think that Don Conway might have said, hey, he's coming for you this evening. But maybe that was part of, um, you know, the ties they had to each other being there from that community were stronger than the ties they, to Jesse, even though, you know, Jesse was living with the Conways, but because he was a newcomer, he was a stranger, they, they, their loyalty laid, I guess, with Guy. But then after, uh, it's so interesting, after Jesse did manage to whip him, knocked him out cold there, then that's, you know, you would, in most situations like that, you think probably what would happen is it would just be a constant fight, like Guy would come back and then they'd fight some more and then he'd have to run him off and all that. But that was it, that did it for Guy. He respected him then. He's just like, well, you, you poured it on me, didn't you? And, and you win, win the uh, fairly, you know, you win. So it's all over, you know, and started calling him Mr. Stewart. That's just so interesting. And really interesting that um, everybody then, you know, people, everyone in the community, they really liked him after that. Well, one thing is maybe they just prized somebody coming out on top. Like he said, they were, you know, diff things were different in those days and entertainment a lot of times might have been fights. And maybe they were just, they were always gonna pull for the winner. So they, you know, they, they liked him after he proved that he could whip Guy. But I wonder, cause especially with the Eastman, Burr Eastman there at the end, telling the story of, um, of guy coming up there to his church and beating up his son and then beating up those other men's sons i wonder if all of them wasn't just a little bit afraid of guy and maybe he'd bullied all of them and that they were just now they were so happy that there actually was somebody that could stop him that could beat him up that maybe that was part of it 
So I don't know. I guess maybe a little bit of both. Maybe they liked him because he'd come out on top. He was They wanted to pull for the winter. But maybe also they knew maybe the bullies' days was kind of over. Maybe. I don't know. And then that last little part about Burst, Burt Eastham. Uh, so interesting how he didn't even know. He was just guessing about the coal that he'd been selling for seven years. He'd been shortchanging himself almost by half. I mean, almost. After you find out that he had 43, I mean, gosh. And But he just didn't know how to figure it himself. And, and then you wonder, did the people buying it from him, did they know? Did they know they were cheating him or did they not know either? You know, I don't know. Somewhere somebody had to because eventually I'm sure they had to weigh it to do whatever they do with it. Anyway, that was really interesting. Um, and, and really neat, perfect example there for Jesse couldn't have planned that better for him to show that example of how to figure the amount of coal. I'm terrible at math, so I, my brain don't work like that. When I hear problems like that, I'm like, my brain just says no 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 i'm not going to do it but some people's really mathematically inclined like that and their brain works like that but how wonderful that he could show all the students but especially don conway who was interested and and then for don to hear him say bert say you know boy i wished i had went to school and i wouldn't have been snookered all this time i wouldn't have been selling all my wagon loads for 25 uh, like they were 25 bushel for seven years you know i could have obviously he needed it everybody usually needs what they uh, or trying to make but especially him nine kids and a wife at home so uh, I'm glad that he figured it out but that was just a perfect teaching example and then I like the part of course talking about May Woods that she was cute as a speckled pup you know uh, sometimes you'll hear people say cute as a speckled pup in a little red wagon but that cute as a speckled pup I've heard that my whole life talking about something that's cute and you know, if you've ever seen a little speckledy pup, they are so cute, you know. Any kind of pup's cute, any kind of little puppy. I've got me a, a buddy here flying around. Uh, but I really liked that part. But the part I liked the best was he said she had heavy eyelashes. Heavy eyelash eyelashes. Um, if Granny was going to say that, what she would say is that she had big eyelashers. She puts the ER on the end of eyelashers. All right, go on, go on. I, the bees are acting like I'm mad today. Anyway, Granny would say big eyelashes or long eyelashes. She puts that ER, so every time I see somebody with long eyelashes, I think of Granny. I can just hear it in my head, long. And he had the longest eyelashes you ever seen. Um, and two of Granny's little great-grandkids, two of my n nephew, I was thinking my niece, they're my great nieces is where I was getting mixed up, but my nephew's little girls, they're my great nieces. They do have the longest eyelashers I have ever seen on kids. They are so long that they curl back up towards their eye. They're, they've got beautiful eyes, both of them, but they, if you catch them with their little, you know, when their eyelashes are, uh, eyelashers are laid down on their cheeks, they just curl back up to their eyes. They are so pretty, uh, beautiful little girls, real sweet. But those, every time I look at them, I hear Granny in my head saying eyelashes. So I liked that part when Bert was talking. He talk, called it though heavy eyelashes. She had heavy eyelashes. So of course we got to wait till next week and we got to see if what happens between um, Jesse and May Woods. If Bert really sets them up and how that goes, if it it turns out to be a good thing or not. I hope you'll leave a comment and tell me about what you enjoyed in this part of the book, what you thought about that fight. And as always, I hope you'll drop back by next Friday so we can see what happens next.